So the, tonight will be like a quickie. This is like the throwback days. Throwback. We were on a good run with like probably had seven, eight weeks in a row of guests. Yeah. So uh, take it back to the essence. Um, we need a break. They need a break from us. We need a break from them. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had getting, some great guests. They were getting tired of us. Those were some great guests. It's different, right? <laughs> yeah, very. Um, sometimes I listen to these healthcare podcasts like at night. And a lot of the healthcare podcasts that I thought were cool and interesting, I now no longer find cool and interesting because um, I think what we're doing is like a little different, a little innovative, and you can't get it somewhere else. Right? I agree. So we got to keep that going. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is how many people are out there doing something different. Like these guys who have like careers off of like coaching men or careers off of uh like trauma and helping uh teenagers get over it i didn't even know those kinds of guys existed that's really good yeah um so you know who picked the song who, dean dean picked it the biggie song the biggie song but that leads to our first question all right let's go okay but i don't know if you'll understand you don't know if i'll understand yeah the question is, are you are, are you aware of the modern day Tupac and Biggie beef? I'm aware of K Dot. Okay. And Drizzy. Okay. All right. I'm so surprised. Now now you know that I know. <laughs> um but a couple of comments. First of all, I don't care what anybody says, it's not modern day Tupac and Biggie. <laughs> you know how you know it's not modern day Tupac and Biggie? Um nobody's ever gonna say, Do you remember in the nineties when there was the Kendrick Lamar Drake beef, but in the '90s, nobody's ever gonna know what is that, yeah. right? It's like saying, "Hey, do you remember the guy in the '90s who was like Anthony Edwards?" No, no, no. You say Anthony Edwards reminds us of MJ because he's one of one. Pac and Biggie are originals. That doesn't change. Um, you know, one of the questions was about Anthony Edwards, yeah, and I'm the sure. comparison to MJ. Yeah, way premature. Way premature, but he's a he's a he's an animal. Yeah, but he's got to win a couple of championships. Yeah. Like, look, Jokic won a championship, and everybody started putting him as, like, one of the five best big men of all time. Now, five minutes later, they're like, get bounced. they're like, he's overrated. He shouldn't win MVP. Yeah, yeah. People people are too captive to the moment. Anthony Edwards is a beast, and I love him as much as everybody. But to immediately be like, wow, this guy's awesome. Let me compare him to Michael Jordan. He hasn't won a championship, <laughs> and he he's, like, in the second round of the playoffs is nuts. It's just people are so captive to the moment. Keep the basketball thoughts for later. We'll, fine, fine. We'll fine. get into that. You brought it up. I did bring it so up. So the the beef, the Kendrick Lamar, uh, Drake beef. Yeah. I'll tell you where it's better than when I was growing up in the nineties. If if there was a beef with us, like Nas, Jay Z, Biggie, whatever, you would have to wait till the next album was released in six months for one track on it, maybe dissing them, like hit them up, Ether, right. Now in forty eight hours, you get like six, seven songs. Like every, like every time you finish listening to like "Not Like Us," it's Family Matters. It's no, like, the it's like it was like Family Matter. Like Dr Kendrick, like dropped two songs yeah, the day before, back to back. Yeah, 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 back to back. Then Drake dropped Family yeah. Matters, and then like an hour later, we got "Not Like Us." Yeah, so so that is definitely an evolution, and that's awesome. And the music that comes of it is amazing. Do you think that's from social media? Like the I, think, I think it's the natural media. evolution of any game. Yeah. Right? It's like if doctors look at how we operate now. They're like, you text your patient. <laughs> You're not on hold. You don't do this. Oh, your MRIs are 3D. <laughs> it's just the natural evolution yeah. of time. I think that's where that comes from. Um, but I, I I think it's interesting. Um, I just hope like it stays, you know, not physical. Sometimes these things have a yeah. have, have a way of getting violent. Yeah. You just don't want that to happen. But um, it's interesting. It's cool. Um, I'm definitely a Kendrick dude, for sure. Um, um, but um, I, I think he's super gifted. Like, yeah. His, he's just, I think he's a super talent. Um, and I like his music a lot more. How about you? You're a Drake guy. I'm a Drake guy. Oh, yeah, I could have guessed that. <laughs> you're, the pop, you're into pop. You're yeah. a pop guy. I mean, look, don't get me wrong. Kendrick's disses have been really good. Um, but I'll, I'll defend BBL Drizzy till the death of me. Really? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, let's get into some of these boring medical questions. No, I'm kidding. Um, someone asked, we'll get this one out the way. What's the best liquid multivitamin for kids? Uh, it's up to, it's like parents' choice. There is no best, right? If you think, if you think about it, if you think, again, vitamins are a, a, an area of massive confusion for folks. 
Um, I forget the statistics. Something like 70% of Americans, something around the 70% of Americans take vitamins. And like less than 5% of them are aware of any specific vitamin deficiency that they have or are scientifically matching the vitamin they're taking to their medical condition. Meaning your aunts and uncles and mothers and brothers that take vitamins, what they do is they go into the supermarket and then they pick the one with the coolest packaging. And, and so think about that. Like you're taking vitamin B this, vitamin A this, vitamin this, this. And many times it's necessary. Many times it's appropriate and it can help. But oftentimes you're taking something where you maybe have a surplus of something already and you have a deficiency of something you're not aware of and you're not supplementing that. And so the best multivitamin is a balanced diet and sunlight 20 to 30 minutes a day. That's the best vitamin because we all need that. Which vitamin you need commercially, I can't tell you without running proper assessment. Cool. Um, someone asked, how do I get my toddler to stop pinching or throwing things when they get upset? Anytime a child misbehaves in any way, especially in the toddler years, pinching, biting, refusing to do whatever, it's you have to, uh, the best advice I could give you is you have to be immediate with your consequences, consistent, and A, emotional. Immediate means you don't want to do this. A lot of families do this. Kid hits, kids bites. Oh, I'm going to count to five. And if you do that again, five, one, two, hits again. Okay. If When your dad comes home, so that's not immediate. All these countdowns and whatever, they're all because the parent doesn't want to have to deal with the confrontation that's necessary. You have to confront the child when they do something wrong. You can't skirt around it. So it has to be immediate because they also don't have long-term memory the way we do. They won't remember when they got home what you're punishing them for. So immediate. It has to be consistent, meaning you can't treat the child differently than your husband or your wife. If you laugh when they bite you and the husband gets mad, you're sending mixed signals. The kid's never going to get it. Those aren't consistent boundaries. So immediate, consistent, and a emotional. Don't raise your voice. Don't hit. Don't laugh. Don't giggle your way through it. Be um, a emotional. You did this wrong. You, you say no. The toddlers understand what no is. When they do it again, which for the first 30 to 50 times, they're going to do it again because this is a new routine. You then immediately put them in timeout or you remove them or some consequence has to be doled out. And if you're immediate, consistent, a emotional, 10, 20, 30 times, you'll readjust the behavior. Nice. Um, this is probably the most asked question we've had the past three weeks. What's your biggest allergy tip you have? Keep the windows closed at home from April to June. Because what happens is you can't prevent you or your child from going out for school or work. That's going to happen. But where parents get it messed up or families get it messed up is they do that and then they open the window because it's hot or they open the window because of whatever, it's nice out. Well, if you had 12 hours of stimulation while you were out all day and now you're getting consistent stimulation while you're home, your system's not getting a break, right? And that's like, think about this. Someone gets sunburned, right? Imagine someone gets sunburned. They come to you. They're like, give me the best cream for sunrise. Oh, here's some calamine or something. They take the calamine, but then they go right back in the sun 24 hours a day. No. You get, the, you get sunburned, get a, take a break, go inside for 12 hours, don't be in the sun. And so keeping the windows closed so your system gets a break is number one. Number two, I think, is um, a lot of, I get a lot of folks that come in and they're like, Dr. Baker, I'm taking Zyrtec, but my eyes are killing me. Just understand this concept in allergy treatment and management. Understand this concept. There's systemic medicine. That's medicine you drink or eat that covers everything a little bit. It covers everything a little bit. So Zyrtec, Claritin, Allegra, Zyzal. So if you have a little bit of a runny nose, a little bit of a scratchy throat, a little bit of itchy eyes, those things work well. But then there's local medicines, which are much more effective if you have a preponderance of symptoms. So I have a little runny nose and a little scratchy throat, but my eyes are killing me. You take the Zyrtec with the eye drops like Patidae or Zatador. Oh, I have a little bit of itchy eyes, a little bit of scratchy throat, but my nose does not stop. You take the Zyrtec with the Flonase or the Patinase. So think of systemic medicine and then local medicines and the combination as they as most appropriate to you is optimal treatment. Many times people come in just taking the Flonase, but like my eyes itch too and I'm coughing. We'll take the Flonase with the Zyrtec. Or they take the Zyrtec and they say, it helps a little bit, but you know, my eyes are still killing me. Then take the eye drops with it. So think of it as in that realm. Window closed, systemic medicine, local medicine. And that combination will optimize treatment. Um, and the season will go till mid-June, early to mid-June. Um, I was giving a talk, I was talking to like the students and the residents the other day about this allergies. And I said this to a couple of families, allergies are interesting. Um, because you know, if you look at healthcare, if you look at medicine, right, think about this, ready? Well, this is what I said. When I was a kid, if 
if when I was a, I mean, you're much younger than me, but when I was a kid, if you found out your grandma had a heart attack, it was a death sentence. If you found out your aunt had cancer, they were dead. Like there was no question. It was like you would hear they had a heart attack or a cancer, and that you were like, all right, well, when's the funeral, right? Like that's how it was back in the day, not long ago when I was young. Now, if someone in your family has an MI, a myocardial infarction, um, and they die, you're a little surprised. You expect them to have a heart attack and survive with modern day medicine. I think if you look up the mortality of MIs these days, it's literally like 20 something percent. When, when I was a kid, it was like 80. Cancer. There's a lot of cancers that still we're not good at, but I mean, breast cancer, a lot of the cancers now we expect to survive. And so in the past generations, couple of generations, many places in healthcare, we've made a lot of strides. We just don't think of this. Allergies is not one of those places. So there's more allergists than ever before. There's more allergy medicine. Zyzel didn't exist 10 years ago. Singular didn't exist, right? More uh, immunotherapy, where we desensitize patients, didn't exist 20 years ago. There's more allergist and more allergy therapy, yet we have more people suffering from all types of allergies than ever before. So we failed <laughs> allergies. <laughs> like when I was a kid, nobody in my class had a peanut allergy. Now half my kids do. Yeah. Right? And more people come in suffering from allergies than ever before. And so put that in the category of child development, right? So MIs, cancers, we've gotten better at allergies, child development, not only are we not improving in some of these categories, things are getting worse, right? We have more developmental disorders in kids than we've ever had before, even though we have all these services, right? Allergies, same thing. So it sucks. It's fascinating. One wonders why. One wonders if they're related. And then all the medications you said, they're all over the counter, right? The, most of them, like singular is prescription. Yeah. Um, Carbonol is prescription. Um, but like Zyzal used to be prescription. Now it's over the counter. Cool. Um, next question. Someone asked, my first trip, my first international trip, going to Cancun with my toddler, anything a must to pack? How old's the kid? They just a toddler. toddler, yeah. Yeah, I tell my families, if you're traveling somewhere, at a minimum, you're taking children's Motrin, children's Tylenol, Benadryl, and probiotics. You know what a family told me we should do? Did I tell you this? Sarah, I don't know if I mentioned this to you. We should have um, like a travel, like a Baker Health travel clinic where um, when someone tells us where they're going, it's like, okay, here's for, like exactly the package you need to take with you. Um, we kind of do this. We kind of tell them on an on a ad hoc basis and they message us. There isn't a damn not FaceTiming someone in Aruba about something. Yeah. Right? Um, but yeah, anyway, so the, the issue is they told us where they're going. Cancun. Cancun, yeah. It's Benadryl, children's Benadryl, children's Tylenol, and um, Motrin and probiotics. Now, sometimes someone's going to Bangladesh, they're going to India, they're going to Hong Kong, they're going to Brazil. There's different vaccines for certain parts of the area, sub-Saharan Africa. Um, like the, there you need meningitis vaccines. Um, but no, Cancun or whatever, just, just that. And then there was another question, just since we're on the topic, on... Um Someone asked sunscreen for my baby, question mark. We're in Florida and want to protect him from the Florida sun. SPF 40 or higher, eye line down. So everywhere except the forehead to compensate for not, you don't put it on the forehead because you don't want it to drip in the eye. Because there's, if obviously you're putting sunscreen on because you're sweating because it's hot. So you don't want a chemical conjunctivitis. So you put the sunscreen from here everywhere, wide rim fisherman hat, SPF 40 or higher, reapply the sunscreen every hour that's 70 degrees or hotter. And when you reapply it, take him inside for a cool down break. You go in the water up to the waistline. So if he splashes, he doesn't get an ear infection. Cool. Um, another toddler question. Someone asked, do you have any tips for my toddler who's refusing to eat food? Yeah, leave him alone. <laughs> Don't force it. I've never had a parent ever in 17 years ever come to me and say, Dr. Baker, Jimmy didn't want to eat. And you know how he got him to eat? I made him. I've never heard that in my career. What happens is I tell him, leave him alone. He's not going to be the first kid to starve to death. No, Dr. Baker, he really doesn't eat. Leave him alone. He won't and then finally, like six months later, the parents like, we gave up. We stopped fighting with him, and now he's eating. <laughs> Usually how it goes. Um, next question. It's a good one. Someone asks, are there any Baker Health secrets you can share with us? Is that like a gossip thing, or is it like a – Tricks of the trade thing. Like, do I go down? Do I? Is that like a? I think it's a tricks of the trade thing. 
All right. Um, so they're not looking or for both. salacious. Like it's not like what is my wife? What is my wife's thing? Those magazines she used to read, People or Us? People is that probably. like a People or Us thing or a JAMA, like Journal of American Medical Association? <laughs> like which which path do I take? You can take both. Okay, so uh, uh, a Baker Health secret that's salacious. Um, our smell. Our smell. Yeah, we copped it from um, a very nice hotel in Miami that <laughs> impressed us. Um. Uh, what's What's a secret? Um, I don't know. I think I think to be honest, I I really the more the more I think about uh, what makes the engine go, it's really one thing and one thing only. It's the quality of the people that we have. Like I'm constantly like so proud of uh, the quality of the team and us not compromising on who we add to the family and to the team. I think that's the key. I think having one lion is better than having a hundred sheep, and you know. Uh, I think that's the key, right? Because in the end, it's it's the people who like make it all go, um, and you know follow up and follow through and blah blah blah. Um, I think everything else is very replicable, right? Um, you could design things a certain way, you could play music a certain way, you could have a scent, and you could have all that. But I think where we differentiate ourselves is the quality of our doctors and the quality of our team. Like I, I mean, today I had a meeting. Me and Iyad today had a meeting with a friend who's in healthcare because um, they needed help with something. Um, Sarah was at the meeting with us. Sarah's like a kid, like 20, 21, 22. Um, she's in a meeting, honestly, with like 60-year-old healthcare executives. These are like, you know them, health accomplished healthcare executives, like top of the food chain. And uh, at 22 in Baker Health, she's sitting across the table from them explaining our thesis and seeing if there's a congruency. And <clears throat> Medium's sitting next to her. And so I, you know, for me, like one thing that I think one thing I'm good at is appreciating the moment and understanding how short this thing, like life and everything is. And I really do take time to, like, I notice those moments. And when I'm sitting there, I'm like, okay, I consider Sarah my sister. I see my wife there and then Iyad there. And I'm like seeing it all there. Um, that that's all in the past couple of years with what we've put together and what we've created. And and this is like still so early. Like this is like, think about all the things we discuss. How many times do we discuss what we want to do? Like, it's great. We have the vitamin infusions. We have the mental health. We have the app. We have the access. We have the yoga, but you know, and I know that's like the tip of the iceberg. Like yeah. we haven't even started. Yeah. Right. And, and so um, I think all this, even this, like what we're doing right now, I, I, I mean, I think people, most, anybody who knows me knows what I'm about to say is true. I don't know if everybody knows this. I, I couldn't put this microphone together. <laughs> Forget like like uh, tripods and cameras. Soundboards. And for, I don't even know what the hell that is. <laughs> um, when you say soundboard, I think cheese. Like, so <laughs> like I, I couldn't put any of it together, right? And so I think it's because we have like just honestly, honestly, I, 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 uh, I'm glad it's recorded. I, I, I've worked with many teams. I've been around. We have a historically high caliber team, like the, the the people in Baker Health now, and it's a young, it skews young, are the people that in the next ten to twenty five years are going to be the ones that solve healthcare at scale, that are going to be leading organizations um, beyond what we're doing now. Um, and I know it, I see it, and I've been around. I've been at the biggest healthcare companies. I've done whatever, and so I've been around. And um, and the one thing he had and I wanted to do was make sure that this time around. We were very selective about who we surrounded ourselves with. Um, and they were completely focused on the mission at hand. Like, that's it, is treat, put the members first, treat every member like family, not just because you say it, and team effort, right? Um, no roles, no designations. Everybody does everything all the time. No, the other day I was, it's a funny story. My, I was talking to my friend and he was like, he was like, hey, like there's this like job opening and like start off salaries 100,000. Like he was like, you should like look into it, whatever. And I'm like, I would like not leave like for one reason. And I'm like, just because of like the connection and like the work site environment and all that, like everything like, and he was like, oh, it's offsite and you work from home, this, this, that, and third, like everything to like everyone would sound amazing. Exactly. And I'm like, it's just like the personal connection, just like seeing like the people come in every day and like them leaving with a smile. That's like, makes it like you can, I can work for free and I, I would like, not want to choose a different pathway of like being at Baker Health. Yeah, that's right. And the, the last thing and we go to the next question is 
a duality that what I'm about to say, any members who are watching or listening are going to probably be a little pissed when I say this. A duality occurs when this happens, and this happens several times a day, where I'm like a little proud and a little disappointed. When we have members, they'll see other doctors or specialists, and they come back, and they're like, I can't, Dr. Baker, don't ever send me to Dr. So-and-so. I'm like, Dr. So-and-so was like literally number one in my medical school class. Like, he's the smartest guy in my class. Um, he operated on my kid. Yeah, but Dr. Baker, they never answer the phone. But Dr. Baker, he made me wait. Dr. Baker, their service sucks. And they will say to me, we're spoiled. Like, now we're used to this kind of caliber of care and service. And so part of me is, like, proud that we've created kind of a new level, disappointed that the member has a crappy experience outside of our offices, and we got to innovate our way out of that, and we have some thoughts. But I think I think what you said is um, – is exactly right. And like, I feel it. I know we're on this journey. I know we're like in the early innings and I know it because with the members, all, the members come back and they tell us. And so I just, I'm very, very grateful for the team we have. Nice. Um, next question. Oh, this is a good one. Someone asked Dr. Baker, we never asked the right questions. How are you doing? I'm great. <laughs> I'm great. I mean, take a look around the world, right? Like I have a job. I know where my next meal's coming. My kids are safe and healthy. That's better than 99.9% .9 of the world. I wake up every day and I go hang out with the people that if, if like, if I got to choose who I hang out with, it's all the people I get to hang out with every day. And, um, in addition, I, uh, my partner is my brother. Um, so, and my wife works in the company. Um, and I have brothers and sisters like Mohammed and Sarah, like it's a dream. I mean, you know, and it's not work. Like we hang out with families. We hang out, you know, people say, well, you know, it's like serious stuff, isn't it? 5% of, you know, most of the care we give is counseling, is hanging out, is con is connecting. It's connecting, right? And I always tell the residents, if the patient doesn't like you, they're not going to listen to you. Your first job as a doctor is to make sure that, that the person you're talking to likes and respects you, right? And, and people are like, yeah, 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 but what's the answer on the test? I'm like, dude, you're not listening. <laughs> you could give them the right answer, but if they don't like and respect you, it doesn't matter. They're not going to listen because if they don't trust you, they're going to go get a second or third opinion. They're not going to do what you say, right? And what they want to see when they look, they look at you. It, they, there's two questions. And this is to all the medical students. You know, we have the Ramis of the world, like all the medical students watching. Two things to remember. Here's what patients want, right? They want to know you know what you're talking about and that you care about them or their kid. That's it. That those are the two things they want to know. Do you know what you're talking about and do you really care? Now, do you know what you're talking about? Because if you really care and you don't know the best answers, you're pretty useless to them. It's nice. You really care. They'll have dinner with you at Thanksgiving, but they don't want you touching their kid. You need to know what you're doing. But if you if you know, if you could quote the books, but you don't care, there's inevitable, not there may be friction in their healthcare journey. There's inevitable friction. They can't get into a specialist. The lab screwed up the blood work. Uh, there's not something might go wrong. The way our healthcare system is, 100% things are going to go wrong. And if you care about them, you're going to push things through. You're going to force the specialist to see them. You're going to follow up with the lab 30 times, even though they screwed up the specimen. So do you know what you're talking about? And do you really care? Yep. <clears throat> um, staying on this topic, somebody asked, what's your biggest challenge you face at Baker Health? I'll tell you the big, yeah, we were just, I mean, Sarah was kind of there. Yeah, and we were talking about it. The biggest challenge we face is we 100% want to avoid um, growth for growth's sake, right? And so uh, we want to just invest in quality of experience and care in like the individual member. And what happens sometimes if you give like a good service or good care, what happens is this person tells this person and then they start to come, right? And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, wow, like uh, we got like whatever, 20 new members today, whatever it is. And you could, you could be vain, and um, you could fall in love with growth, and it's happened to me in the past. And and it's not a bad thing because one thing, to uh, let me defend the old us before I explain the new us. And I do believe this on some level still. The greatest affirmation that what you're doing is working is growth, meaning, meaning, let me explain this. Every doctor, and it could be any industry, it could be lawyers, it could be restaurants, it could be whatever, but anybody you go to in their business is going to tell you they're the best. True or false? True. Have you, have you ever gone to a restaurant and, and the chef's like, you know, we're good. Like our shrimp scampi is good, but the guy down the street's better. 
Nobody no, says that. No. They think their restaurant's the best. Yeah. That lawyer thinks his law firm's the best, right? Well, you know how you know the best? Who's growing? Because you could only grow if this person's telling the other person to come to you, right? So growth is a is a very telltale sign. It's an affirmation that you're doing the right thing. The problem is if you grow, um, it is very easy, very easy to start to focus on keeping up with growth instead of keeping up with your standards. So if I have a certain standard of how I want to treat you, I can focus on everything when you come in. If all of a sudden somebody else comes through the door, no matter what, my, my focus on your standards is now split in half. And not only is it split, mathematically, it's going to drop in half or whatever it may be. And so the biggest challenge we have, I don't think it's a challenge. I think it's a constant reminder is every single member has to feel like they're the only, I mean, we say this, is the only member that is being treated by Baker Health. They couldn't have been responded to faster. They couldn't have been taken care of better. Meaning, 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 every member has to feel that the 100 employees we have and uh, whatever we have is all there just for them. They want to get a yoga class tonight. They're not told they have to wait a week. They want to get a vitamin infusion Saturday. They text us at 9 a.m. and at 10 a.m. they get the vitamin infusion. They're in Singapore and they have a sore throat and they have a sinus infection. They message us and that night we have a Z-Pack delivered to the concierge at their hotel, which that's how, how you would treat your brother or sister, right? And to never lose that no matter what. Now, it would be nice to be able to deliver that to more people, but I'd rather deliver it to less people at that level than deliver an A plus to less people than to deliver like a B to more people. Nice. Um, next question someone asked. Hmm. Which one do I want to go to? Let's talk about this one. Can you talk about how the best way to deal with family aging and suffering from medical issues and direct and ripple effects and how to best handle? Um, that's not easy. Um, it's, it's not easy. In fact, today, uh, a couple of us were at uh, what I think is the best assisted living um facility in Northern Jersey. And we were, we were exchanging notes and trying to understand for our geriatric population, how we can innovate because as old folks get older, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, they get dementia among many other things. And so the people we were meeting with today, they're leaders in that field. Um, and, uh, I think they're the best care one and, um, Mr. Uh, Strauss. Yeah. And so we're exchanging notes and um, I think the aging question is a very, very difficult one. Um, people are the, people are living now longer with more chronic medical problems. And so um, a lot of the times your parent becomes somebody different. You know, what happened in the old days, grandma died at 68 of a heart attack or a stroke. But the day before she died, she was walking and talking and she was the same grandma she was always. Now what happens is grandma dies at 99 and for the last 10 years of her life, she was unrecognizable because she doesn't remember you. She can't feed herself. And so there's this, the, the term ripple effect is very appropriate. There's this impact on the family itself. Not to mention, um, due to the way society is now, you know, in the old days, it was almost a given that as someone got older, they were going to move in with you and you take care of them. And basically when you're, you know, in your thirties, forties and fifties, you had your children and you had your parents and you were kind of like the linchpin. Now both parents are working. A lot of kids don't live near their grandparents or parents, right? Parents live in Arizona, family lives in New Jersey, whatever it is. And that's why you see assisted living facilities, you nursing homes, SNFs. And so it's much more expensive. It's much more complicated, both medically and personally. And so it is not easy. Uh, the only advice um, I would give, and we once had that guest, I forget, she was an excellent doctor. The um, hospice doctor. Yeah. She was geriatrician. Yeah. She was excellent. I thought she was excellent. Yeah, she was um, great. Especially on the topic. Yeah, she was great. We should have her back. But I, I think the best advice is plan for it now. Whether whether it's DNRs, whether it's hospice, like discussing death and end of life is should not be taboo. 
newsflash, you're all going to die. So you better discuss it. And it's not shameful to discuss death. It's shameful to discuss it while you're dying and making rash and emotional decisions when the person who should be making the decisions is not in the capacity to do so. That's what's shameful. And so you should preempt it and know what their wishes are. Now, there's legal documents and blah, 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 but I think a conversation about it in advance, do you want to be in a nursing home? Do you want to stay with us? Should we move you here? Do you want to move out here? Do you want somebody at the house? Like all those, I cannot tell you how many people, I, by the way, not only people we've taken care of, in my own family, how many times these conversations happen at the inopportune time. Now someone's debilitated and either they can't make the decisions for themselves or you're now like running up the hill and you're trying to make shift the staircase or you're trying to scramble to see, can you get a nurse visiting nursing aid, right? We're all going to get old. Something's going to happen to us and we're all going to die. That's just going to happen. To, to not confront it at a certain point in time, I think is ridiculous. I think she was telling us like when someone is in their 20s, she starts having those conversations with them. Yeah. So the only thing you can do, because you can't predict the future other than things are going to go south eventually. And so you want to just have those conversations and be open and honest about it. Nice. <clears throat> Next question. This is a good question. Someone asked, how do you talk to your kids about complex world events? Um, I think the mistake folks make when, when it comes to uh, a lot of the crazy shit that happens in the world um, is they, they imbue their child with their own opinion on the matter. And I don't think that's necessarily the smartest parenting technique. Um, I think when there's complicated situations in the world, it's a good learning opportunity for your child only if you use it as a learning opportunity, not as an opportunity to instill doctrine or dogma. So you don't want to point at one side or the other and say they're trash, they're this, that. Um, in fact, I would argue that by doing that, you're contributing to perpetuating making the world the crappy place it can be sometimes just adding people to the different sides. I think you want to ask questions more than give answers to your kids. And it's called the Socratic method, but basically you ask questions, say, what do you think about this? And let them read certain things from hopefully unbiased media, <laughs> which is hard to find <laughs> these days, and let them get some of the facts and say, given the facts, what do you think? And just ask questions and as they give you answers, ask more questions in a guiding fashion. And I think if you take that approach through these experiences, your child's gonna come out much more intellectually strong and curious. And in the end, what are we talking about here? Are you talking about you want your kid to have the answers to the test before the test? Or do you want them to come out of the test having learned the answers? So um, I think when people think about how to talk to your child about complex world issues, I think it's more listening. It's just asking the right questions. Um, you know, like even at the, at the school level, like even in the school level, sometimes things happen every school, like there's stuff that happens or whatever. Um, and there's so much noise and gossip and stuff. And the other day when we were in a room with a member. Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like 20 minutes, 20 minutes. So you, what I think what happens is you don't want to feed into the noise and the drama. I think, uh, always just ask yourself, what do I want for my kid out of this experience? What you want is for them to be intellectually curious and honest, high integrity. And, and unfortunately, these things are a journey. They're not going to happen from one experience or one conversation, but it's consistency throughout. Nice. A um, couple more questions before we wrap up. Someone asked, what's your best age to retire in your opinion? What's that? Best age to retire? Yeah, in your opinion. I think there is no best Asking age. the wrong person. Yeah. Um, I don't like the word retire. Um, retire. Retire, like, to me, uh, nobody's, people are, we're going to make comments about this. To me, retire is like death. <laughs> retire is the end. Re when I hear the word retire, like retired to the bedroom, retired to sleep, <coughs> retire, tired. The word tired comes to mind. It's like you're you're done. You're exhausted. You're finished. That's the opposite of how I want to live, right? Even if I change careers, that's all I'm doing. I'm changing careers. I'm not retiring, right? Um, I think if you retire, your soul retires. Yeah. Right. Like, what do you what What do you want to do? Like, I, again, I'm d I'm definitely the wrong person. Go play golf. That's what they want oh you to do. Oh my god! Like, <laughs> shoot me now. Then forget about it. Um, I'd rather die in the office than on the golf course, man. So, 
Uh, I don't know, man. I can't. We just spent the first 20 minutes of this thing talking about how much we love jumping out of bed, going to work. <laughs> like, I think, um, I don't know, what's a good age to retire, man? Um, today, if you're asking the question. Yeah. Right? And and uh, otherwise, to me, you don't retire. You just do what you love. And then if you stop loving it, you find something else that you love. And you do that. Like, so the wheels how, fall off. Yeah. A um, couple more questions. Someone asked, have you watched the Tom Brady roast yet? If so, what are your thoughts? No. Did you watch it? No, I didn't watch it. I got, did you watch it? I watched it. How was it? It was good. It was funny. It's good, right? By the way, Bill, Belichick was there. Everyone was there. Everyone was there. Everyone was there. I got to watch it. Kevin Hart, Dana Wade. I'm saving it for like a night because you know what it is? Now I'm distracted with the playoffs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean. You, there, yeah. So it's, um, you know, Sarah Baker asked me today. She was like, have you watched it? And I'm like, no. Like every time Sarah I, watch it? She's watching it right now. Um, she, I'm like, every time I like want to watch it, there's a crazy playoffs. basketball game. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. No, but I heard it's awesome. Yeah. Um, and then. So what did you think of the Giants draft picks? You didn't tell me. I loved it, but I don't think we have a, like I think he's a great receiver. Yeah, he's, he's people had him number one on his on their boards. Um, the rest of the draft was good too. How about quarterback? I want to give him. I want to give Daniel Jones hope, but but I don't think the coaches are giving it. Like I think they. Like, I think they've like retired. Like they signed what's his name, Drew Locke. Like he's gonna start the. It's gonna be another rough year, but I don't know. I think it was a good draft, but it's still dark times for Giants fans. What do you think of Brunson and what he's doing? Insane. Historic. Historic, but I think you know. I think Knicks like. I'm rooting for the Knicks, and I'm a Nets fan, and I'm saying I'm rooting for the Knicks. But I think the Knicks are gonna be in for a rude awakening if they make it out, which they will make it out this round when they get to the Celtics. Like you're gonna have Brunson. He's gonna be seeing Drew Holiday and. Derek White double team. Yeah, which is nasty. And then, like, say he does get past them, he's going to see Jalen's Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown in the paint. And then Brzingis. And then Porzingis. I mean, and he's really their only scorer. And and, and Anobi just got hurt. Yeah. Um. But, I, I mean, they, it's they need, unbelievable what yeah, he's doing. Yeah, it's a crazy ride. It's, it's, and New I, York needs and, it. And if you ask me today who my favorite player in the NBA is, I'd honestly answer Josh Hart. <laughs> he, Him getting he, I saw rebounds. I today. He played every minute for the past three games. 15 minutes in the whole playoffs. He's had rest. Yeah. How do you not love minutes. the Knicks, man? I mean, yeah. it's The other day I was like to my brother, because we're like diehard. Like Jason, like we're new, new, Nets fans Me from too. New Jersey. Me too. And I'm like, I think like, I'm like, I got to root for the Knicks. And he was like, he was like, you shouldn't be my brother then. <laughs> no, no, no. I went through that same situation actually, uh, but 10 years ago. Because to me, I told you this. To me, once they took... The Nets out, out of, of New, New Jersey. Jersey. That's it. it just changed, yeah. When your wife cheats on you, she's not your wife. <laughs> I don't know, like when these people are like, "Well, it's the Nets." I'm like, "No, no, no. they left you." Yeah, they left you. This, this, I mean, like, uh, what's his name? He was on here a couple weeks ago. So Rod said the Prudential Center's still open, so Brooklyn's clearly not working out. We need some heavy hitters to bring them back. Yeah. Oh. Um. The last question was about the playoffs. Kind of talked about it. Um, what do you think about the Nuggets? They're in trouble. Big trouble. They're in trouble. I think the T Wolves will beat them, but I still think I don't know that the T Wolves are going to knock out uh, the Celtics. That's going to be crazy. So you think the T Wolves go if, like if they get out the Nuggets series, they go to the oh I I mean <laughs> OKC or Dallas is not beating either the Nuggets or I think I think this series the Nuggets T Wolves is definitely the Western Conference Finals. And then I think depending either team, I think the T-Wolves have a better chance of being the Celtics than the Nuggets. Like if the Nuggets against Boston, I'd actually pick Boston. The only reason I think T-Wolves like have a chance is because of the defense they play. Sick defense. And Jalen, uh, not Jalen Brown, uh, Jason Tatum not showing up in the fourth quarter. Yeah, those are good reasons. Yeah. But gun to your head, you're picking who wins the championship at this moment. Who are you picking? T-Wolves. Yeah. That's it. That's all I got for today. It was a quick one. It was good. So we have a new app update. Uh, what is it again? You can book yoga through the app. Oh, there's a lot of content. There's new content on the app. Meditation, exercises, fitness with our partners at Phoenix who are the best in the business. 
and yoga. So beginner's yoga, yoga with your children. So go 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 to the app. Do they have to download the new version? Yeah, if your phone didn't already update, update the it. new new app, and there's like hours of new content. Yep. Right. There's hours on mental health, physical health, um, and we're releasing more content. It's going to be around um, specialty specific. So you have diabetes. We're going to go over what to eat, what not to eat, how often you have to get your A1C checked. Right. Yep. If you're uh, on a weight loss journey. Right. We're going to go over that. So we're producing a lot of content that's just for members through that app. And so we've started to, to put that up there. And so and booking yoga classes, I think that's huge. booking yoga classes is huge. Yeah. Um, you could book vitamin infusions Been, yeah. already. Um, and then the Upper West Side location is opening on June 3rd. First week of June. It's First week up. of June. Yeah. All right. That was fun. Yep. Nice solo, old school. Old school. Fam style. Yep.